for this opportunity to talk. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk about data and models of geosystems, opportunities for, and requests to the IS community. Um, first, I just thought I'd go over a little bit, go back to the 2015 workshop um, report and talk, just, just mention essentially um, what were listed there as geoscience challenges um, re requiring innovations in intelligent systems. And basically what I wanted to point out is the breadth of this, the breadth of the topics, the breadth of, of the scales and relationships between data. Um, and then here there's listed um, um, some specific situations that examples were provided for in that report. Um, and the goal of enabling holistic uh, research on the Earth as a system. Um, that same report talked about some initial synthesis and themes, and these are just very, um, you know, familiar to all of us of the kinds of things we're trying to do. Um, then there was a roadmap for intelligent system research uh, with benefits to geoscience. Um, again, some, some really great um, uh, IS capabilities and the whole idea of trying to bring those into geoscience um, is incredibly exciting. Okay, um, some perspectives not represented in the report um, are social perspectives, which are mentioned twice, and economics, which are mentioned not at all. Um, and I'm going to actually bring those into this talk, um, and uh, we can we can then amongst us discuss whether we want you know whether it's best to stay in a purely sort of scientific realm or also reach out to consequences uh, elsewhere. Um, to my mind, these are important um, to how people interact with the Earth, and it's really that interaction that governs what and how Earth science is pursued in any given point in the long history of people on Earth. Um, um, and here we consider um, <clears throat> data models of geosystems, opportunities for and requests for the IS uh, community. Again, that's just the title of this talk. Um, and I'm going to look at a problem with explicit consideration of social and economic aspects. Um, and I say this beca because the future of people, at this point it's becoming quite clear, the future of people on Earth depend on what we do. Um, and on what, uh, and, and what, what people do depends on communities and economics. Okay, the advertised about my talk was, I was, I was going to talk about how to acquire knowledge of big data and dynamics in geosystems using examples from groundwater and climate change along with best practices for doing better geoscience by extracting the meaning from models and data. And I just have a couple of edits to that to just set you up for what I'm really gonna deliver. I'm gonna, to my mind, the how to acquire some of those big patterns, um, some of that's IS work, um, um, some of that's geo work, but I'm gonna talk more about how to use knowledge of big patterns and dynamics and geosystems um, using examples from groundwater and climate change and so on. And then with an emphasis on using IS geo for decision support including support of decisions about household income and public policy. So there's kind of a scale there on these issues as well. Um, do you have any questions at this point or comments? Feel free to interrupt. Okay, I'll just wait a minute in case people wanna take off from mute, but okay, let's go. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna to talk to you about is is a food energy water calculator for Western Kansas that, that I've been developing. And I'm, I'm going to um, talk about IS geo interactions in that context. Um, this is a, a, a work that is going on in Kansas that includes um, several entities within the Kansas academic community and a lot of different departments being represented. Um, it's kind of like a mortgage calculator, but more complicated. So you can think of it as a model, but it's um, uh, 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 it, it's not, uh, it has all the pieces in it. There's many pieces in it that you'll be familiar with, um, but it's put together a little differently. It provides analysis of farm income trade-offs. In this case, for the particular problem in Western Kansas, um, um, income can potentially increase on farms from wind energy uh, possibilities, um, but that would require changes in Kansas regulations. Um, that would allow more locally advantageous development of the wind power. Um, there's in income decreases on the horizon because farmers 
Um, well, mostly because the Ogallala Aquifer is being depleted. In this scenario, farmers would, in, would voluntarily relinquish some water rights to get that permission to develop water energy in the more locally advantageous, uh, to, to be able to develop uh, wind energy in more locally advantageous ways. And the trade makes the change to Kansas regulations possible. It, just in Kansas, because of how the politics work, it's not going to work unless the farmers get on board and are um, and, and they are going to get on board largely because of the water issue. So the goals are to conserve and extend usable life of the Ogallala, maintain as much crop production into the future as possible, and keep farm revenues and local economies healthy by also harvesting wind energy. Uh, okay, this just gives you an idea of, of the area involved. This is Western Kansas. And in, on this map, um, the uh, brown areas are areas that are already basically not usable for irrigation um, that had been usable in the past. Um, the red areas have less than 25 years to go. Um, and then you can see that some areas have larger amounts. So the yellow areas have up to 100, 250 years estimated. Um, there's two things about this. One is, one is that there, the changes over the area, but also if you look at the key, the ranges are fairly large, especially as you get out. It's 100 to 250 years. It's, it's a big horizon to try to plan with. And yet this is very typical with geologic problems of not being able to be precise. Okay, this is a picture of a well that has gone dry. It's no longer being used. This would have been the center of a center pivot irrigation, um, but the land is now not, uh, it's just growing weeds basically. Um, so it hasn't even been reseeded. Um, okay, so the picture on the left is the same one I showed you before with how much uh, time is left in different parts of the aquifer system. The picture on the right is, a, is, a, is the, uh, an image of wind energy potential in the United States and the Western Kansas has a little black box around it. And you can see that this center, central area of the country has the best terrestrial wind ca uh, capabilities um, in the country. Some of the offshore areas are are good like this as well, but but as far as terrestrial sources, it's that middle of the country that really has um, a tremendous um, opportunity. Okay, so these farmers could so so here we have um, we have farming and all the impacts there with water and stuff that are all geoscience interests. There's wind energy that has all sorts of atmospheric and geoscience interests. Um, and, and how do and how do these how do we inform how do we as geologists inform this and then also there's this thing about uh, about um, um, the policies that are occurring um, and this slide is really getting to that the the policies and the economics um, so as people as farmers start turning to turbines they have a couple of options the most common thing is that large companies come in and lease land from people to put up wind turbines um, and those payments are about five to seven thousand per year per turbine in Kansas in Iowa it's actually more like ten to twelve thousand um, and there was, this is a, a quote from somebody in Nebraska who was getting land lease payments of about 32,000 a year, which of course he loved. Um, but later in the article, there was something about this other farmer who talks about one turbine changed my life. So clearly there's something different going on here. Basically what's happening here from an economic viewpoint. Um, so the, basically the income from wind energy depends on how it's developed and it can be much more profitable to local owners and economies um, if they can have direct ownership of the source of production. However, that's not always available. In Kansas, it's not accessible to farmers. That There would need to be changes in regulations. And unless the farmers know about that, they can't even start lobbying or expressing interest in it. Okay. So that's where this food energy water calculator comes in. This slide shows some pieces related to that. And just one second, I can, I'm gonna get this out of here. Okay. Um, uh, okay. 
Um, the input to the calculator are things, um, uh, there are some uh, um, things that come in from satellite data and things like that, and some from local analysis. Um, the agriculture, for example, there's been a lot of work done to relate applied irrigation to net revenue in different parts. This is one such graph related to corn production, so that's an input. For energy, um, besides the wind map um, and, and detailed wind maps to show what actual parcels are, are, have a lot of wind energy, um, there's the sales rate for um, energy, which is hugely important. There's also federal and state tax policy. And in water, there's a groundwater model in that area that relates irrigation reduction to changes in water level and how long irrigation remains viable. The, the main output from the calculator is farm income using graphs like this. The, in this particular example, um, you can see that the green line goes down a little bit. That's indicating that they're gonna have less water to use or they agree to reduce their irrigation. And um, so their farm income goes down, their agricultural income goes down. But they're, uh, they start producing wind energy and it goes, so they get a little bit of income from that. It's small because in the beginning there's a loan involved that has to be paid. Um, basically, it's their investment in the infrastructure for this new, but the new energy economy, basically. Um, once that loan's paid off, their income in this scenario doubles. Um, um, and when I talked to farmers about this, they were like, well, if that's the projection, we can get loans from the bank to help us through the part that's down and blah, blah, blah. These, essentially, these people are used to dealing with fairly big numbers. When you talk to them about wind energy production, you're basically talking to them about loans that are about 10 times more than they're used to. So it's not something they, it's something that they can get their heads around. Okay, so this is, this is the calculator. Okay, so now we're starting to get into IS, which is a very rudimentary level here, okay? It's Excel, <laughs> okay? And, um, but that was, a, a, um, that was a, a um, capability that I could get, you know, I had people who could put it together and um, we could begin this way. The goal is to go to a web-based capability um, that would have all the flexibility and ability to bring in, uh, to, to connect with web sources and things like that. Um, and that's absolutely where we wanna go. Um, but as a first step, uh, we are using Excel. Okay, so with this Excel, there's external data sources that would come in. Um, uh, um, as I said, the, with the Excel, it's limited how we can bring in the external data sources, but uh, and we're doing it by hand now instead of being able to seek things from the web. Well, we're seeking things from the web, but bringing it in by hand, um, and that would need to be automated. On the top box on the top left, that's numbered one. The user inputs where they are located. Um, 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 and then they would go to columns two and three where they choose their activity and choose options and data. There's a row for agriculture, energy, water, um, weather and climate, um, and um, uh, environmental services. Um, although it's interesting, sort of the, the biggest environmental service is wa services are water and weather and climate, but um, that, so that what ends up in environmental services ends up being things like um, um, uh, prairie chicken issues and issues related to, to wildlife, largely. Okay, um, and um, so each, uh, and then the column four on the far side would be, um, the calculated results that would then go into the calcul the the graph at the top number five that would um, uh, um, um, that would show the income consequences of the scenario outlined. Um, okay, uh, and then one example of that graph is shown on the on the right. So that's what they'd be most interested in. Okay, um, this is just a very simple view of what this workflow would look like um, for you to connect to some of the ISGO. I wanted some of the 
information systems, I wanted to show you a more detailed version. So, um, for example, um, um, the for under energy production, we can there could be automatically downloaded um, um, uh, maps related to wind energy, or or if they were choosing solar energy. Um, and there's downloads related to um, uh, uh, groundwater and results from either groundwater data analysis or modeling. Um, and then there are downloads related to um, climate, uh, the climate situation and possible climate change for, this, for the time period involved. Um, okay, so, and then also for environmental services. Okay, so I think it's pretty easy to see how this could, you know, this isn't a decision, um, a decision making framework and you can, I think, see pretty easily how the geoscience data comes into it. Okay. So one question. Please. Um, how, how long does it uh, usually take users to, to input all the data to get uh, the calculator going? Um, right, so right now, so this is a prototype, and um, and um, uh, so we don't have really users yet. In a sense, we have taken that we've customized the things we've put in have been related to Southwest Kansas, the example that we've chosen here, um, and we have talked about it with farmers. Um, and shown them the kinds of things that we can do. So, so right now it doesn't take much time because it's pretty hardwired. There's uh, specific things that people can can work with. Um, as mm -hmm. so, we'll have and as part of the proposal that we have in on this, we have sociologists involved who uh, who would. Um, do experiments to see how things are working and work with us to make that better. Um, so, and clearly data download is a problem. Uh, right now, um, it's set up just even in Excel. So if you click on the maps on the left, it'll pop up a big version. But when we did that connected to the web and had it download, it was taking too long. So we've loaded it into Excel directly. Um, so it pops up really fast. Um, so, so those are, um, the idea is that it has to be structured in a way that it would work fast and it would work fairly easily. So, but that, but that means it's more limited in terms of, um, specifics. Um, but the other thing is we're really, we're working with a population that is just starting to understand that they have alternatives in terms of how the wind energy is developed. Um, so even getting them the basic idea that um, uh, that a little bit of knowledge um, can um, result in a pretty different future for both them and the region involved. Um, <laughs> that's essentially enough of a meth of a message. Did that answer your question enough? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have uh, no, no, a quick follow-up question, but no, no, I guess that's probably uh, how close to the end of the presentation are you? Uh, I, oh, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Yeah, I should be fine. Okay, because no, 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 mine is more of a summary question on are you submitting to US, anything here to USDA's um, uh, current AFRI foundational grant this this cycle? I, uh, I talked to the program managers about submitting last summer and essentially my understanding from them is they weren't really interested in anything that talked about being able to produce less agriculture. Okay. They, they were we Let's discuss this afterwards. Uh, not, as, not, uh, yeah, might. that would be great. I did submit to the to the Food Energy Water Nexus um, okay. call from the from uh, NSF, and that is associated with USDA. Okay. But yeah, I would love to. Yeah, I can. I had a. I've had a couple of long conversations with the program managers, and I would love to talk to 
or the one program manager. And I would love to talk to somebody else about that because some of the impressions I got, I was pretty sure couldn't be completely agency wide, but it was pretty discouraging in terms of, of applying to them last summer. Okay. Excellent. Okay. And who is that I'm talking to? Uh, that was Daniel and I'll, I'll send you an email follow up, but uh, right now. That would be great. Okay. Yeah, um, the, the, so there are two Daniels. One is Daniel. Hello? So, uh, hi, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, I just wanted to, I, I, it's Yulia, I just wanted to add something about this uh, FE uh, program. Um, we actually talked to um, a program manager as well pretty recently. Uh, we tried to do some combination of machine learning for agricultural insurance and they were also not not discouraging. So I guess that one of the things is that the primary problem with a budget, and I guess I, I couldn't get an idea what is really their primary interest. Like it, it looks like mainly sensing of the data. So it's not doing that much of a modeling. That, that is the impression that I got from conversation with them. As those of us who have tried to work with USDA, maybe we should talk together. Yes, I guess that maybe we can, yes, schedule something, um, yeah. Yeah, and maybe even schedule something with some program managers from there to see yeah. if we have, because it seems to me- so My experience is pretty recent, like just whatever, say months or two months ago. Uh-huh, yeah, mine was last July. Okay, so I'll keep going. The next, um, uh, uh, actually, just a second. yeah, so this is, I, I reversed these last two slides, but this is just the same thing I just showed you with bigger type <laughs> uh, to try to make it easier when you first saw it. Okay. And then this is what the detail, the, uh, this is the same thing in more detail. Um, and I'm rewarding opportunity and I have like 15 So I have one, one question. Um, how, how do you do the, the, the whole integration of the models that are representing each of the aspects, agriculture with energy production, water, etc.? Yeah, so each one has to, and I didn't outline that too terribly much in, my, for in one, one of the slides. The, I talked about the user input in this slide, but I didn't talk about the <laughs> numbers, models, etc. that come in. Um, and one thing in connection with that was that um, this one of the premises, one, one of the basic things for this model development is that um, we, we are very respectful of these users. There is no way that I'm going to produce something that even pretends to tell a farmer how, the, how to do their agriculture or what, might be, what the income might be given different decisions. They know that better than I do. So, so the idea is that um, anything that is put in here in terms of equations we provide, they can overwrite. That's even, in, that's even included, for example, um, in this figure, where for the climate and weather, there's climate change numbers to 2046. Hopefully there would be a way to go out and capture those numbers for this region to put into this table. Um, I think that's something we would have to work with the climate change folks to be able to, to, to do, uh, perhaps. Um, but anyway, so let's say this, the, 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 the um, this program goes out and gets those numbers. And let's say the farmer is irritated by that, thinking, I don't believe these scientists on this anyway. This, this would allow them to go and change those numbers, okay? And it, which makes them do two things. One is it makes them look to see what the predictions are. They have to at least notice them, okay? And the other is they'll notice if it makes much difference to their income. Um, and, and to my mind, I would rather have that kind of thing where I'm empowering the user than trying to shove something down their throats. So, um, um, okay, and most of the other... Um, but I get that my, my question was a little bit more um, about, okay, what, what if I want to change my model for energy production? How do I make sure that it's going to fit uh, well with the previous agriculture model, right? The, uh, so uh, uh, did, did, with the previous agriculture, so that uh, what, what interactions particularly are you interested in between energy and agriculture when you think about that? 
Um, I don't know. I um, I I don't know, but I um, I guess that there are more than than one agricultural model, right? There there may be many, depending. I don't yeah. know where you are, the surroundings, and each of them uh, are. I mean, they have their own variables, their own outputs, their own results. So I was wondering on what would happen if I wanted to just switch them, right? Yeah, so, so for example, so one example of that might be this is being developed currently for California, but, but obviously this could be, the structure is perfectly applicable to California. And did I say that? It's currently being developed for Kansas, but it could be adapted to use in California. The USDA has programs that, um, uh, agricultural programs that can be used both in like a seasonal basis. So when, when farmers are deciding what crops to put yeah. in the summer and for a, a day by day or week by week basis when they're deciding on their irrigation schedules. And um, for this calculator, I would think for the most part, people would be interested in the former, where the, the kinds of programs that are uh, broader in scale temporally. Um, and then one, the idea would be uh, to take some fundamental parts of that program and integrate it into a simple representation in the calculator. And that's what that graph on the right under agriculture represents that particular. So that's a great, and I can't, I know you can't see it here. I, I had a bigger version of it before. It's just for corn, get, depending on your irrigation, there's a crop yield consequence and a farm income consequence. Um, uh, but the full program um, is also available and our and, and what we're thinking is that we would have a button, uh, and we wouldn't do this till we got to the web version, but we'd have the cap capability for someone to go and access that program and run it, and then have selected outputs come back in. Um, so from that perspective, this, it seems to me this could be made quite flexible um, in terms of linking to uh, other, other programs. It would take a communication with the developers of those other programs. Um, if something like this became popular enough, we might be able to talk them into creating certain kinds of um, input and output capabilities to make it easy to pick up numbers. Um, otherwise, we'd have to have a, you know, we could have a wrapper of some kind that would communicate between the two programs. Um, is that, does that address your question? More or less, more or less. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And then the energy, the, 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 uh, the, um, the energy production very much depend the, the, the equations that I've used so far are pretty, um, simple. Um, the big, the big variables are the production rate. Um, yeah. so, if, so, so if a, if a, if a turbine is a two megawatt turbine, and here this is showing that a two megawatt turbine costs three million dollars so if you have two of them which is being prescribed here that's a six million dollar investment there's also grid connection that would have to be done um, that produces a loan payment of four hundred fifty two thousand a year which is a 20-year um, loan um, there's operation and management assumptions things like that um, then again when you get into the income you have to account for grid absorption how much of the energy you produce can actually be absorbed onto the grid um, and we're using a hundred percent currently there's also something called the production rate which I mentioned before so the production rate depends on the quality of the wind so that purple area in the map I showed you has really high production factor it's like 45 percent which is what's listed here um, although there are gullies and stuff that don't have 45%. It's not like you can put in a wind tower anywhere. Um, and um, the, the, I think the country, our country on average has 35% production rate. So some areas have quite a bit lower. And then that average sale price is a big deal. And, and the sale, electric sale prices, the whole thing is very, very complicated. So we would bring in, a, we're, working with, we're working with people from all of these avenues and essentially what we're trying to do is take their knowledge and distill it down into something simple that they can still buy into okay this is the same way that i build groundwater models okay <coughs> i have a who will talk who will 
debate how things should be done. And then we, we try to work together to get something, a simplification they can live with, you know, and, and I figure if I've been able to get that from the discipline experts and come to something we can all agree on that it's probably pretty good. Um, so that's the process of this. Um, so I haven't, there aren't specific models in for the energy production that I've seen. It's more that kind of um, discussion. Um, okay, is that anything else related to that? Okay. So I will, I'll go ahead on, on because I think I'm now late. Um, so these were, I was just showing some things in detail. You can kind of see in bigger print some of the things that I've just spoken about. Um, and this is the output that I showed you before. If you looked quickly, you would, could have seen that there was another graph that showed that they would double their income during the loan period and triple it afterwards. And that's for if the price of electricity goes from 3.85 cents to 4.77 cents on average a kilowatt hour. Okay, so, so, what's, the, so what's the utility to ISGO? Um, uh, general awareness of how earth science is used in decision-making tools. Um, so basically how, earth science, how in this manner at least earth science impacts people. Um, to my mind, and I, and I talked with uh, Ibrahim yesterday, and um, um, it seemed like there might be a potential for a benchmark, partly either in this, either using this framework, this model, yeah. um, because the relations are quite simple. A lot of them are, they, they, there's a lot of relations, but the, each of them is quite simple. We're not into complex models at this point. Um, uh, Ibrahim uh, talked about that his um, rainfall runoff modeling example that he's also doing a decision making process related to that. Um, he talked about the that the model is so big and the scenarios are few and that it was a little bit more difficult to work with. <clears throat> um, so um, 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 to my mind, trying to bring the ISGO kind of perspective into this is, to my mind, really exciting. And we have some great expertise between Suzanne, Ibrahim, uh, me, and, and I'm sure others. Um, but in talking to Ibrahim, we talked about that it was difficult to define success matrix, but that we're going to need to define success matrix. We had some ideas on that. Um, identify which problem to consider and identify who's going to do it. Okay. Um, Okay, I can actually stop there, I think, at this point. Uh, my last slides were not um, particularly um, useful for this group. Um, I, we, uh, so I am open for questions if we have time. Sure, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, so we'll leave it open for anyone that has any other questions that they want to clear. If there are no other questions, I would love to hear more about the benchmark data part, but we can also talk offline about that. That doesn't have to be here. Okay. And I, it might be, I would be interested in, um, you know, other people's perspectives about you, you know, do you have, I mean, what are your thoughts about having one benchmark that's associated with decision-making tools? Do you think that's a good idea? Do you, what do you think? I, there's nothing wrong with having it. I mean, decision making is another machine learning task. So that makes yes. sense. The trouble is always, as you always said, that these success metrics, and we always struggled with that with the methane thing. It's always hard to define those. And it's, you have to have a certain sample size for people to, to see, and, and some correct results that you obtain through some other means. But we could also make it more open But we can talk more one on one if you want to. Okay, that sounds that sounds great. So, so this Anybody is Suzanne, and can y'all hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. So um, one of the things that I think would be really interesting from the benchmark perspective would be to uh, cast a net for a set of data 
that or simulations or um, dynamic. But when I say dynamic models, I don't mean dynamic in the optimization sense. I mean just like interactive, um, <laughs> more like systems dynamics models. But looking at uh, robustness and resilience, right? So how do you define a robust solution and how can various algorithmic or um, IS approaches help scientists understand their data and information in the context of robustness. So that goes in the decision-making context everywhere from how do you select a representative decision variable all the way through how do you understand what, the, what your performance metric really means and then ultimately you can even move on to the participatory part which is when you co-design with stakeholders how do you have the discussion with them to make sure that the decision variables, um, objective functions, and performance measures all represent what they want them to represent. Not just their preferences, but actually represent the behaviors and drive deeper dialogue that they're interested in understanding. I, I don't know if that made sense, but that's what I mm. have. One of the things Ibrahim had talked about is, is along those same lines, and I think, is then to use how people to to record basically or, or keep track of how people interact with the calculator to indicate how well you know your success so if they if it's so confusing to them that they don't do anything with it then they clearly you're not getting where you want if you're seeing them you know look up different alternatives and 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 play getting getting results under different circumstances then clearly that's a success um, so, and that's a more, that's, that's a way to, um, something that's, that's data that's fairly easy to access when, um, well, if it's designed, if the, if the tool is designed that way, it's data that's pretty easy to access. And we have in, in our, um, in our proposal, we have that as part of the, um, uh, design criteria. And um, it was interesting talking to Ibrahim because he's, he's just talked about that he's put together decision support stuff with nice IS capabilities. And he talked about that there have been lessons learned and, and that this, this would, um, a, a benchmark could, you know, documenting a benchmark could be a way to bring those lessons to the fore. How about you, Ibrahim, and I set up sometime a meeting? That would be great. Count me in too. Me yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, Suzanne, this is really, you've been working in this area longer than I have. So it's, I, that would be great. I think Yulia could contribute a whole lot. I don't know if Yulia is still on the call, but it would be uh, her risk and insurance analyses and the sophistication. Yeah, I'm still on the call. Yes. yes yeah, I am. I'd love to have you in that. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's, I think that, um, um, that, that's, th there are a number of, uh, directions here and, um, I guess, uh, one, as I said, but we can explore, um, relationship to agricultural insurance, um, and particularly because of the data available and the other, uh, the other place, um, that, that we can potentially approach is, um, the risk that the company that collects data um, different insurance companies um, and aggregates that uh, on a county level, they sell this data, but they're also, from what I know from my collaborators from NOAA, they are also interested to um, collaborate with um, academia on how this data could be used. And I think this, um, the current talk about, you know, how SGO can move forward is that actually maybe we can invite somebody from Verisk and show what we are doing and um, uh, how we can combine uh, our atmospheric data with uh, the insurance data. I know that sometimes if they have a joint project, they allow to use their data for free and that's like a wealth of information about um, insurance claims uh, in, in, it's in the county level, but it's still better than than nothing. Uh, that's for um, house 
house insurances for whole United States over the last whatever, I think 30 or 40 years. That, that would be great. One of the big things here has been that crop insurance, up until recently, crop insurance has required full irrigation. So that if they didn't irrigate as much as fully, if they tried to cut back mm -hmm. on their water, they wouldn't be covered as much by insurance. And that has changed over the last couple of years. So that's just one example of how it's important. Yeah, that's, um, we tried, uh, so what we, uh, um, so far what we have done in terms of crop insurance. So we looked at crop yields at uh, different parts um, uh, of Northern United States and then Southern uh, provinces in Canada. And um, we tried to run the cluster analysis uh, on crop yields and optimal crop mix um, and trying to understand where you can run something like um, you know Bayesian belief net for example to, to better understand um, the relationship between atmospheric variables and um, type of crop yields and um, how you can optimize uh, multiple crops together so we I mean, that, that, that was really a very, very pilot project, but uh, I'll be interested, I mean, I'll, I'll be interested to collaborate and I have the data collected. I had students who collected a bunch of information and um, we can actually compare that in terms of US and Canada and then availability. Like if you also, you can use different type of initializations um, in this model. So you can take in situ data or you can take uh, data coming in from, for example, environment in Canada, and you have a completely different result. So Uncertainty quantification is, a, um, is, is, is critical for that. Uh, yeah, the, the, crop, the, the, the crop model from, from, that has been funded from, from USDA through the Extension Service in Kansas has optimization in there. So people, someone using it can say they want to deal with four different crops. These are the options. This is their acreage. This is their water situation. This is how much they want to spend on fertilizer, and then they, mm -hmm. can, they, and then it'll optimize across that and say how much per acre they can make. Um, that's how they normalize it. Yeah, but, uh, but that, that's right. But uh, from I mean, from also what I learned from uh, um, from actuarial perspective, and although I'm not an actuary, but uh, in um, agricultural insurance, we are trying to move toward what is called index-based insurance. What's it? What's the so word? Something-based. Index. Index-based. Index index index. okay. Yeah. So the idea of that is the following: so instead of looking at a particular um, farm um, and understanding what is their crop yield is, they are developing an index based. On uh, purely on atmospheric variables, right. and um, then for essentially for the whole area, for example, I, I'm, I'm just making up, but something like almost like cooling degree days, or heating degree days. So if the index is changing more than certain number of units, then the whole area that is affected will have a payout. Okay. Yeah, and, and that makes sense. It's like a drought area or something like that. It's that's a, that's right. I mean, so the there are issues. Of course. Yeah, there are issues, of course, in doing that. I mean, the, the, the process is that you actually just rely it's completely objective because you only rely on atmospheric data. Um, so there is no, um, you know, you don't need to to yeah, exactly. You don't need to hire assessors. You don't need to work with people like whether it's a true claim or it's a false claim and so on. So that insurance company minimizes uh, uh, their costs. Uh, on the other hand, there is a problem of what is called basis risk uh, in insurance. So basis risk is something that when, um, because the, you know, it's spatially aggregated. So there might be a situation that somebody um, who is supposed to get the payout didn't get the payout because, for example, his farming agency had elevation lower than you know, than everybody else in this area, or right. somebody who didn't supposed to get, uh, wasn't supposed to get a payout, we got it because, you know, the, the elevation was higher and so on. So, because, and so, so how you handle a spatial um, resolution is very important. And so 
you have data on very many different scales. And so here's where how you can actually use any of the machine learning techniques to improve it. So there's right. this this is a big difference than what my understanding what currently USDA funded, but there's a lot of interest in SOA, Society of Actuaries, on how they can minimize their basis risk by using more sophisticated machine learning methods to improve uh, their index based insurance. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a very different perspective. I'm going to, I think there's a slide. Oops, I'm not going. I don't know. My, my and I'll be, I have a collection of papers and all this, and I'll be, I mean, we might actually have a, like a separate group of, you know, people who are trying to do something on, on <laughs> related to. It might be, so that one of the, for this thing that I'm developing, one of the, one, the, the real premise is that people need to, understand what's going on around them and what their options are and it's only by that that you then get the pressure to change how we do things essentially um, mm -hmm. so that's how you change legislation um, and in this case it's um, um, trying to just I mean give people the science but in a wrapped in a way that's of interest to them so that's why it's economic you know and that's, mm -hmm. um, um, and there, all these people are impacted by, you know, their own agricultural insurance policies. Um, and we talked about whether that should come explicitly into the calculator. And basically, we're, we were told by the agricultural people not to bother, <laughs> that it was, um, mm -hmm. that, they, that they knew what that was. And we didn't need to really bring that into the mix of this particular effort. So it was a request from them that we got feedback from them saying we didn't need to do that. Um, but obviously it's very important in a broader perspective. And, and if there's anything related to this approach or structure for, you know, information structure provided by this, that would be cool. Are there, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. We're, I think we're pretty over time. <laughs> yeah, we're a little bit of um, past the deadline. And I think that one of the lessons uh, from your presentation um, it was very, really, really interesting, and there seems to be a lot of interest um, in the topic and people wanting to contribute from different um, aspects and, and perspectives. So perhaps, like you guys mentioned, it would be beneficial to organize a subgroup so that you guys can meet um, and have these conversations more in depth. Sounds great. Because there seems to be a lot of interest and thank you so much for for your presentation we oh, really appreciate thanks. it thanks for the opportunity I, I appreciate that excellent okay yeah thank you thank you a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot mary thank you daniel thank you bye-bye thanks everyone okay thank bye -bye. you everyone bye-bye bye okay thank you bye